So our first speaker for this session is Bill Sarchi. He's the director of photo director of photography, writer, and also a teacher who is based in San Francisco. He has shot film, video, and ACTV projects in 30 countries and 40 states. Um, he's also interviewed several, a few presidents for his Emmy Award winning West Wing documentary special. I believe he'll be seeing part of that today as he talks about problem solving and ad adapting to the digital world. Try anything to sell you one of their few pianos. All too anxious to unload one on you. Fortunately, now there's Sherman Clay's Piano Max. Here you'll find no hassle, no hard sell, just guaranteed low prices. The widest selection, new and used, rentals, even piano lessons. At Piano Max, your piano superstore. No one on our team had dropped a piano before. A new challenge. 
Before the shoot day, the special effects crew removed the 200 tightly wound piano strings and the heavy soundboard, sawed through other structural elements so they would break apart easily on impact, and loosened the keys and the internal hammer so they would flop and bounce around for dramatic effect. The piano was positioned to fall with the keys facing toward the camera. Then it was hauled up to the pipe grid above the studio, very carefully. The special effects crew had made a clever custom release mechanism with a pair of C-shaped hooks that met in the middle. The rig had a release pin that pull, they pulled from the side, releasing both hooks in opposite directions so the object fell straight down. They had tested it many times with sandbags. With the piano ready to drop from the rigging, but still held in place by an extra safety line, we locked down the camera, a technique as old as silent filmmaking, locking the tripod, placing barriers around the camera so no one would bump in, positioning my camera assistant to snarl at anyone who came nearby. <laughs> Next, we shot the scene where the actor playing the customer looks up and then runs off to the right as the proprietor sits very still in the background. Then we cut. And with the camera still locked down, the, camera, the customer safely out of the way, and the proprietor still in the shot, the rigging crew unfastened the extra safety line, we rolled again, and the custom release mechanism securing the camera was pulled. Kaboom! Down came the camera. This camera lockdown technique allowed us to apply continuous action, even though the camera had actually cut as the actors and props were rearranged. In addition, we used foreshortening, the same optical illusion that makes the pitcher and catcher as viewed from center field in a televised baseball game, appear to be fairly close together. Here, foreshortening helped create the illusion that the piano fell right in front of the proprietor when in fact it was a good 15 feet behind, behind the drop zone. The final technique we employed was slow motion, often used in action scenes, explosions, and stunts. Gravity is relentless, and pianos, like most things, fall pretty quickly. To extend the screen time for the stunt, we slow the final action down to about half speed, and yet it still takes place in a fraction of a second. Incidentally, the special effects supervisor had never, never dropped a piano before, but sometime later he rigged a shot with a flaming meteor that fell on the hood of a convertible as a couple was making out in the back seat. <laughs> uh, apparently, once you've dropped a piano, a meteor is, is just a small step up. <laughs> Hi, I'm Steve Jobs, and I'm here at Tyson's Corner Mall in Virginia, right outside of Washington, D.C., and I'm standing in front of this wood barricade we built in front of our first retail store that's going to open in six days. Now, nobody's seen inside here yet, and I'd like to take you inside for a secret little private tour, so come on in. This is our store, and the store is divided into four parts. The first quarter of the store has our home section with great home and education products and our pro section with all our great pro products. And every product we make is in this first 25% of the store. You can see the whole product line. And as you see up on the ceiling, we've even labeled the sections. Home, music, kids, genius on this side, and pro, movie, photos, and etc. on this side. So the first 25% shows you our entire product line. Now there's 36 computers on display in the store. Every single one of them is connected to the internet. So you can go up to any computer. Steve Jobs was a world-class presenter and marketeer, as in this film I shot for the opening of the first Apple store in Virginia 11 years ago. But he was not a filmmaker. He had little patience for the deliberate, tortoise-like speed of most film or video productions. I'd filmed him before in brief studio shoots where the crew stood behind black drapes out, out of, outside of his eyeline so he couldn't see them. And many crews had waited all day in vain for Steve to appear and talk to the camera for two or three minutes. Apparently, he was off, he was off building the most successful company ever, and our little shoots on any given day were sometimes less important in his universe. But the Apple stores were a costly expansion, a new and risky venture. He wanted to film a video tour, but unsurprisingly, he wanted to do it his way. Our director told us Steve's idea, that he would be alone in the store with a cameraman, 
in the most low tech setup, the most low tech setup possible, a handheld camera with an on camera microphone with no other crew, no lighting in the store, and no wires anywhere. He would start out in front of the black barrier, which still separated the unopened store from the mall, then walk through the barrier and lead the viewers through the store in one long, un uninterrupted take. Simple, huh? Except for a few challenges, which made our skin crawl as we anticipated them. First and foremost, no wires at that, at that time meant that we had no control over the picture, that no one except me would be able to see and judge Steve's performance in my shots, and our director would thus be out of the loop. Of course, we could play back the video, but we knew Steve wouldn't wait around for that, and we knew we had to get it right the first time. But if we could run a long, neat bundle of cables from my, from my camera to the storage room in the back of the store, the director, producer, and our client from Apple could watch and listen. The on-camera mic was a bad idea, too, so we needed to have our sound recorders trail behind me during the tour. Another problem, the bright lighting in the store came from the ceiling. It was maximized to make the products look good, even though they look pretty old right now, don't they? <laughs> uh, but making the products look good was a very different goal from making the CEO look good. The store allowed us to add sheets of our own uh, lighting diffusion material for, to, to the uh, fluorescent lights overhead. But were we really planning to shoot this man in glasses, dressed in black, walking in a continuous shot through overly bright white product areas, and then into the dimmer, black-walled theater where his shirt might melt into the walls. This plan was destined for disaster if we let the auto-exposure unit and the camera control the brightness of our picture. But a lifeline cable back to the storage room would mean that our video engineer could also monitor the picture and remotely adjust the brightness, contrast, and color on my camera as needed as we rolled. To do this right, someone had to face down the leader of the free world. A man who was accustomed to getting his own way, meaning that our director had to convince Steve uh, that this methodology was a good idea and that we needed to, to monitor and control quality. As a colleague of mine often insisted, don't give them what they want, give them what they need. Steve grumbled about the camera cable and the sound man, but he went along, grabbing a lavalier mic and pinning it without ceremony on, on the front of his turtleneck. Did you notice how he pointed away at several times at, at sections of the news store and I panned the camera over and then back to him? I didn't do that in the first take and he stopped and glared at me. The director and I had agreed that I would stay on Steve at those moments and we would shoot the other sections of the store separately and edit them in. Steve disagreed. I apologize for the quality of the video we're viewing. Even in the original, it's a bit difficult to see what I'm panning to when I go up to the ceiling. But we did it his way. And so it went. We did walk around the store quite a bit on camera. We couldn't do it all in one take, so we cut and reset between sections. In the new Genius Bar, Steve told the audience, I'm not a genius, but I'll stand behind you. At the back of the store, the theater video and audio hiccuped and glitched briefly as he switched modes. He grew angry about the glitch, called in an Apple engineer, dressed him down, and appeared to fire the man on the spot. The man left quietly, but the following week our client assured me that he was still on the job and back in Steve's good graces. But that day in the first Apple store, Steve was done. Our client implored him to stay a few more minutes to shoot a wrap-up. He gave us a quick, I'll see you when the store opens, on camera, and he was gone. It's impossible to tell from this copy pulled off the internet, but we did pretty well. Having control of the camera and audio, in a very portable, impromptu situation that had to look and sound great, coupled with clever editing and, of course, Steve Jobs' marketing genius, give the piece the feel of a seamless personal tour. And now, 11 years later, Apple stores are by far the most profitable real estate space in the country. Retail, excuse me, the most profitable retail real estate space in the country. Next clip. If you did an interview with everybody that worked in our administration, almost everybody walks into an Oval Office and gets cotton in their mouth. And I said, well, this can't be in my office. It's obviously a mistake. On Capitol Hill, at least, you knew, you knew when you were out of session, you were out of session. And when you had a break, you had a break. 
When I went to the White House, there is no break. You're never off job. You're never not at the White House, even when you're sleeping. People really viewed it as a once in a lifetime shot, and you would have a life and, a, and sleep after. I just felt every day that it was such a privilege to be there. The decisions that you help frame have a power and a might and a significance that is pretty awesome at times. And you think, oh my God, we're running the country? <laughs> There's a lot of ways to screw up. Well, when I moved from one end of Pennsylvania Avenue to the other end and occupied the Oval Office, my perspective changed significantly. Uh, what is the problem is if you tell the president something that is very contrary to his opinions and very contrary to what he'd like to hear. And so if you take a chance and fail, you know, there's no doubt there's a deleterious effect on your popularity. Whereas if you take a chance and, and succeed, it's very good. There's always a danger you have to take. There's room up on Mount Rushmore for one more face. <laughs> if you do well, you might get there. And I must tell you, the day I walked out of the White House, I was more idealistic than the day I walked in. This clip is from a special episode I shot for the West Wing on NBC. During the period of intense patriotic outbursts after 9-11, Aaron Sorkin and his cohorts on that series wanted to celebrate public service. We interviewed three former presidents, cabinet members, and a dozen presidential aides about the culture of working in the White House. This was intercut with fictional scenes from the West Wing <coughs> from past episodes. I thought this format sounded pretty hokey when I first heard about it, but the results were wonderful and were very moving. The challenge here for us with a small crew was to, light and seri and sh was to light and shoot a series of mostly middle-aged guys with glasses and, at best, graying hair in a variety of West Wing-like environments and to make a cut seamlessly with a Hollywood series where they spent millions of dollars per episode creating dramatic scenes with brilliant actors. Also, we were shooting on video and the West Wing was shot in film. There's nothing more synergistic than a production crew. We're all in this together, I tell my students. We each contribute our expertise. For a more film-like look, we put a filter on our video camera, a piece of black Mexican bridal veil stretched on an accessory ring over the rear element of our zoom lens. Our video engineer helped set the rich look for our show, maintaining healthy contrast ratios and warm color balance. Our grip crew put up a 12 by 12 foot double layered net in the shot, out of focus, a few feet behind each interview subject in order to soften the backgrounds. Our set dresser in Washington advised us that the American flag, which is in nearly every shot, traditionally appears on the left side of the frame. We didn't know that. For gray heads, our lighting crew reduced, reduced the light coming from behind. For bald guys, we turned off the backlight completely to eliminate glare bouncing off shiny skulls. <laughs> in most cases, we elevated our subjects, raised them up a few inches for more dramatic angles, and we carefully framed lamps or windows in the backgrounds of our shots to motivate warm or cool side light or backlight striking the faces. This type of source light helped us emulate the dramatic look of the West Wing as much as we could with sit-down interviews. The director agreed to let us see each interviewee on camera in the interview chair for 30 seconds immediately after arrival and before makeup or prep, with the correct island the way they were going to be looking when they were interviewed, and with no one standing in the light. The crew was always poised at these moments to make quick changes. This short inspection determined whether we raised or lowered the key light, bumped it more to the side for more lighting ratio, or, or more frontal for more light in both eyes. These 30 seconds were critical for us to scrutinize our subjects, particular facial topography, wardrobe and glasses. The light struck everyone's bone structure and complexion differently. We didn't really know how the lighting would look on our actual subjects until we saw them. I had been a pre-law government major in college and it was a thrill to meet many of these public servants and to shoot in, in, in DC. But one of my biggest challenges came about when I found myself tongue-tied around Bill Clinton. I've met six former or future presidents, and I've, I've shot five of them, filmically speaking. <laughs> Richard Nixon's the only one, by the way. 
of, of see, I mean, you can't be shooting. Of the three in the West Wing documentary, Jimmy Carter gave us exactly a half hour of, our, of his time, including a pleasant greeting, handshake, interview, and group photo. Gerald Ford was recovering from a stroke, and affable, but only to a point. But Bill Clinton, who I, whom I had long admired for his politics, intelligence, and wit, greeted each of us, did the interview, shook everyone's hand, thanked us, posed for pictures, and then hung out chatting for another half hour as we read. Less than a year removed from the presidency, he gabbed easily about public policy issues and about his own future. But what was in my heart that day, what I couldn't bring myself to say, was the fact that we had both recently lost our dogs. <laughs> Harry Truman once said that if you need a friend in Washington, get a dog. And the Clintons did exactly that early in his second term. But his dog, Buddy, was killed by a car a few weeks before we interviewed the former president, around the time our family dog, Sophie, died of old age. What to do? This work often involves judging how personal to get with VIPs. I usually try to maintain a friendly, professional distance. But I wanted to say to President Clinton, Enough about Republicans and taxes. We've got something in common. Let's talk about our poor dead puppies. <laughs> I made a bashful professional decision not to. But I wrote him a condolence letter afterward, and he responded warmly four short months later. Connection, <laughs> con connection made. Sometimes the best challenges are the personal ones. The ability to acquire and propagate images with ease doesn't make you a Spielberg any more than learning to write turns you into a Shakespeare. Our technology is getting ever simpler and ever more complex. I can't imagine what our tech toys will be, what devices we'll be using 12 years from now. But I do know that the tools are not always tangible or technological. Ingenuity will never become obsolete. Creativity will never go out of style. As we adapt to accelerating changes in technology, Inquisitiveness, collaboration, and problem solving will always be in demand. It's about thinking on your feet. Going digital has not changed that. When presented with unusual situations and people, piano drops, technical demands, recalcitrant CEOs, or charismatic ex-presidents, or whatever the future has in store for all of us, the ability to improvise is a special quality that will always thrive. Thank you.